This week on This is America and the World, our guest is Todd Moss. He's Chief Operating Officer and Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. He was former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs. He's also the author of a new best-selling thriller, The Golden Hour. I love the book on three levels, Great. and I've read the whole thing. One, it tells you about Africa mm -hmm. in a kind of an entertaining way. Uh, number two, it's a thriller, and the story just plays. And the third thing is it tells you an awful lot about the behind the scenes of the U.S. government on all three of those levels. Just terrific, just great fun. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, I couldn't ask for anything more because that's exactly what I was trying to do. Uh -huh. you know, I really, I read, I like to read a thriller on the beach. I wanted to write something fun that somebody uh -huh. could read at the beach. I wanted to share my love of Africa. I've been working on Africa for 25 years. And I also wanted to take people inside the sausage machine of U.S. foreign policy these days where it seems like every day the United States is facing some international crisis, government's being called upon to do something. It's not clear how do we come up with these crazy answers that don't seem to be working. Yeah, there's a, there's a sentence floating around someplace in my mind where somebody says in the book, it's not a coup until we say it's a coup. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and it reminded me of the power of the United States to kind of call things, and there's a couple of things floating around in my mind where recently they didn't want to label something as it actually was right. because that demands a whole new course of action. That's right. I think you're probably talking about the coup in Egypt. Yes. Uh, well, the yes, reason, yes, right, yes, th yes. There's, two, there's two reasons for that. One is that, you know, maybe we're not feeling very strong right now, but we're still the United States of America. The yeah. world looks to us uh -huh. for what's going on, what is the sole remaining superpower going to do. So that's still very important. Um, there's also some legal aspects where once a coup is declared by the State Department, mm -hmm. uh, certain things have to happen uh -huh. on our side, including certain kinds of military and foreign assistance have to be cut off. So sometimes if there's a moment where, wait, maybe it's not a coup, let's wait and see if we can fix this, uh -huh. uh, you don't want to declare it too soon because that has these implications. You were under Bush 43. That's right. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State African Bureau, right? Correct. Uh, what should we know about Africa when we see news stories or mm. see things on television or what, you know? You know, I think for many Americans, Africa seems very far away. The lens that they think, maybe they think about Black Hawk Down or some late night commercial, somebody pleading for some, you know, a few dollars for famine relief or something like that. Uh, but actually, Africa's a lot closer to the United States than, than we know, and it's getting closer. Uh, there's a really important positive story here, which is that Africa, yes, it has a lot of poverty, but it's growing right now very fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One, you know, one of the most dynamic uh, regions of the world right now, and we're now starting to see American companies pouring in billions of dollars in investment in mm -hmm, Africa mm -hmm. in ways that 10 years ago was just not happening. So it's a very exciting economic time. At the same time, there are a number of real national security threats. We've pounded al-Qaeda and terror groups in the Middle East. They've popped up in other places around the world, including in Africa. Uh, there's al-Shabaab in the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. In the Sahara Desert, there are several terrorist groups, including al-Qaeda-type offshoots. And those are regularly attacking our allies, sometimes attacking the United States. And we're both the positive economic story and the worrying security threats are going to draw the U.S. closer mm. to wow. Africa. So I was looking at, was, uh, you, you mentioned poverty, there's horrible infrastructure problems, yep. terrorism, smuggling, kidnapping, corruption. Yet, at the same time, we were just, you may uh, know this, we were just in Benin, mm -hmm. and uh, Ambassador Rayner, who we uh, interviewed there, said, land of opportunity, Africa, <laughs> land of opportunity. Right. So you got these two good news, bad news things going on at the same time, huh? Yeah, it's, it's you know, I think that, first of all, Africa is 53 countries, Yeah. so, you know, People overseas may see news reports about problems in Ferguson, Missouri, but why would you see that and not go to New York City? We would think that would be crazy. Uh -huh. Just like there may be problems in uh, places in Libya, uh -huh. but that shouldn't prevent you from going to Benin or mm -hmm. Ghana or Kenya or Nigeria. 
And, and even in a place like Nigeria, which has all the great things going on in Africa and a lot of the problems, uh, those that's just the mix. Um, mm. And the opportunities really are quite quite great. What, what's going on in Africa, Ambassador Rayner's absolutely correct. What's going on in Africa, many African countries right now, is the transition that America went through in the 30s and 40s. Families are coming out of poverty. They're buying the first refrigerator that the oh. family's ever had, uh -huh. the first washing machine, the first car. And that's having a huge effect on people's lives. And for American companies, it's creating all kinds of demand. Let me, let me toss one more at you uh, that, I, uh, that I introduced with Ambassador Rayner. And it's a sensitive question. Mm. And I'd be interested to see how you respond. Uh, I think that the United States somewhat has missed the boat in Africa. And I think it has something to do with our own racial history. Do you buy that? I don't know the answer on, on, on the race. What, certainly, the United States doesn't have the tight hist historical linkages that Europe mm -hmm. has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do with the country of Liberia, which was founded by freed American slaves. Right. We have a special relationship with Liberia. But for most of the rest of the continent, we have quite a distant relationship. Um, which is just not true for other regions, especially Europe. In the last couple of sort of decade or so, the Chinese have been pouring a ton of money, yes. the Malaysians, Indians, a lot of money into Africa. We have been a little bit late to that, but we are starting to catch up. Hmm. Uh, let me say to the folks at home, uh, Todd Moss, who has a terrific experience uh, as a diplomat representing the United States to 16 West African uh, countries, under uh, President Bush's uh, uh, rule in the United States, they're called a rule, I guess. Uh, he is um, he's, a, he's an expert on Africa, but also is the author of this brand new book called The Golden Hour. And uh, he's formerly, uh, formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, as I mentioned. Uh, he's uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer and Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. And uh, lots to talk about, including the kind of parallel between real life and fact and fiction uh, and fantasy here in this new book, uh, The Golden Hour. Sit tight. We'll be right back on the other side. This is America and the World is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. ANA, Japan's largest airline with an extensive network throughout Asia. Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology. Sharing tomorrow. The Petrolin Group, expertise with integrity in the fields of oil and gas, exploration and production, energy and infrastructure. The Republic of Kazakhstan, a rich history and a future of development and growth. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings and Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services. So there's a big jump. There's a big jump from being a diplomat mm -hmm. and one of the think tankers here in <laughs> Washington, uh, and all of a sudden you're on bestseller lists, uh, your book is being displayed in all the bookstores, you're on the radio, television show. <laughs> That is like a roller coaster ride, isn't it? <laughs> you've been you've been a writer in the past, though, right? I have. I've I've written nonfiction books, and when I left government at the end of two thousand eight, I actually planned to write another nonfiction book. G about give us some of the titles that would uh, not, not not drive us you to know, the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to write about this concept of whole of government, which is normally spelled with a W in whole. But I like to think of it as whole and that it shows how government doesn't work because we've got so many agencies involved in decision making uh -huh. that things get stuck. Uh, and uh, if you think just our intelligence agencies, we've got 16 of those. You add in the Defense Department, 20 plus bureaus in the State Department, and a lot of the decisions are made by bureaucratic infighting and 
all kinds of uh, backroom maneuvering rather than the way that you would imagine, which is let's get the facts and let's get a, a right. strategy to, mm -hmm, to meet mm -hmm. our interests. So that's what I was planning to write a book about. Um, but I decided that it would reach a much wider audience and it would be much more fun for me to write if I made it a thriller. And I, so I, I created this character, Judd Riker. Uh -huh. He's a college professor at Amherst. Oh, he's you and you he's know it. Me. He's, <laughs> not <laughs> <me>. <laughs> he's not me. He's not me. And uh, and he's thrust in, into the State Department uh, to set up a crisis reaction unit. And of course, what's the first thing that happens is everybody ignores him. Uh -huh. He can't get any he can't get any traction. But through a series of accidents, there's a coup in Mali in uh -huh. West Africa, and he's made the point person, and this is his chance to show that quick reaction, that the, if he seizes the so-called golden hour, that he can show that America can achieve uh, its, its objectives. Okay, let's get a definition of the golden sure. hour. So the golden hour, it's a real concept. I used to drive an ambulance in Boston. We had this rule of thumb that somebody has a major trauma, you have to get them to the, in front of a doctor within an hour or their chances of survival plummet. Mm -hmm. So in the story, Judd Riker finds that with coups, if we don't reverse a coup within 100 hours, our chances of ever reversing that coup plummet. And he uses that as the basis for setting up this rapid reaction unit within mm -hmm. the State Department. Any basis in, basis in fact on that? So there's no empirical study that proves this. Yeah. But I think if we look at the events going on now in Syria, uh, in, in, uh, in, with the Ebola crisis in West Africa, we can see that if we sit back and wait for events, if we hesitate, mm -hmm. things get out of control. Mm -hmm. And if we don't react quickly, we're not shaping events. And that's the basis uh, for for the golden hour and for the, the the pace of the story, which is he's only got a hundred hours to to make this work. Uh huh. Some of the other characters involved are a couple of generals. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. There's uh there there's a there's a general. There's a president. Uh, a couple of generals. President. A couple of generals in Mali. Uh, on the U S side, there's a uh, a very grouchy uh, assistant secretary that he that is his sort of arch nemesis. He's got to deal with Central Intelligence Agency. He's got to deal with uh, the White House. He's got to deal with the Secretary of State's Chief of Staff, who's sort of his patron, but he isn't sure if he can trust him. He's got to deal with lobbyists and all the kind of typical Washington cocktail of players trying to influence events. Okay, so you say Judd Riker is not Todd Moss. Right. I'll buy that, <laughs> although you do teach a class at Georgetown University. I right? do. You are a teacher, right? Yes. Yes, and you are an expert <laughs> on, on Africa. Tell me the parallels that have gone on in this book and in your real life. Well, what, so what happened, the incident that inspired me to write this story in the first place was a real coup in August of 2008 in Mauritania, another country of West Africa. They were, you know, no, very few people have heard of Mauritania, but they were a close counterterrorism partner for the United States. Uh, a general had overthrown a democratically elected president. Uh, I was having brunch with my family in Silver Spring at the time when I got the call, uh, and Secretary Condoleezza Rice asked me to go to Nouakchott to talk with the general, tell him we can't stand for this, and if you don't stand down and put the president back, we're going to cut off our aid program and we will move our security cooperation elsewhere. And of course, he, re he refused. Uh, and we did cut our program and we moved our troops and our planes to other countries. So there was a real coup and a real Todd Moss representing the United States was sent there by Secretary Rice. That was the inspiration for the, for the original part of the story, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you're writing the book, just grinding it out. What happened, and the, and the book is set in Mali. Right, so I thought, who's heard of Nouakchott, Mauritania? Very few people but everyone has heard of Timbuktu. Yep. Even if they don't know if it's a real place or where it is, everyone knows Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. So I decided to put the story in Mali. A lot of the action takes place in Timbuktu, in the capital, Bamako. I'd spent more time in Mali. I'd been around the country. I could draw on that experience to make it authentic. Uh, and I thought, actually, Mali looks pretty good right now. Why not? I'll put the story there. And six weeks after I finished writing the book, uh, Molly had a real coup. <laughs> now, a lot of people have asked me, "Did you predict this?" It's actually the opposite. I never, I never saw it coming. Did you predict? Did you make it happen in order to make the book 
My Lord, isn't that amazing? It was huh? amazing to wake up that day. Uh -huh. And in fact, I thought... What I, did they say at the publishing house? Well, I didn't, even, <laughs> I didn't have an agent or a publisher yet. So oh. my first thought is I should just put, I should self-publish this right now. <laughs> so I spoke to a couple of friends in the literary world who said, no, don't worry. Very few Americans know that there's a real coup in Mali. Stick to your guns. But I do think that the fiction, you know, real life following fiction helped me to first get an agent uh -huh. um, uh -huh. and then second to sell it to, uh, you know, a, a top notch publisher like Penguin. Penguin, right. So, so there is this parallel. I want to talk to you about, in the, in the book, we should say that uh, women play a pretty dominant role. That's Secretary right. of State. Uh, and I was thinking of, there was uh, Secretary uh, uh, Albright, mm -hmm. Secretary Rice, and Secretary Clinton. Right. All women. And in the book, um, do we have uh, the woman is the ambassador? Correct. From the United States. Yep. And of course, uh, Judge Wife plays a role. That's right. You know, I, in, in a lot of the book interviews I've done, everyone's asking, why did you write about such strong women? Uh -huh. And the answer is, it wasn't a conscious choice. Actually, after Secretary Albright Rice yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Clinton, it seemed perfectly natural to have a female Secretary of State. Uh, in my life, I've always lived in a house of strong women. It seemed like the new normal. Uh, <laughs> and so I put lots of strong women yeah. uh, characters in, in the story. Uh, it just seemed like uh, a much more natural fit. You write a fiction so nicely because uh, you paint pictures for us to take Thank in. You. I can't do that. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I just am more of a nonfiction uh, mm -hmm. writer, but, but you do that so, so beautifully. I want to kind of tap into a couple of thoughts that I had. As I was reading the book, and you learned so much about Africa, and it was such great fun because we had just been there. I thought of Benghazi. Mm -hmm. And I also, so let's talk about, because we've got embassies all over the world. Yes. And that's obviously a horrible <laughs> hot spot that produced a horrible result yes. for four Americans, including the ambassador. Right. Uh, ambassador Stevens, right? Correct. Uh, what do you think, as you know the world in those 16 countries that you mm -hmm. were heading up for West Africa back then, uh, these countries are volatile and they're also uh, maybe not so well guarded. Mm -hmm. And here the ambassador went out to one of his missions or whatever you call them. Uh, mm -hmm. That was an accident waiting to happen, wasn't it, in a way? I'm sorry to say yeah. that, but it was, wasn't it? Well, the reality is that, yes, we might have a small marine guard at each embassy, uh -huh. but the protection of the embassy and for American citizens, we rely on, on local uh, security and police forces. Yes. Uh, and in lots of places, they're, you know, they're not wonderful. The, the bigger issue, though, I think from Benghazi is, and this is an issue in the story, is that in these faraway places where we wish we were omniscient, but we're not, no. we have to deal with, with both a massive flood of information, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know, this mm -hmm. drinking from the fire hose is what happens during a crisis, yeah. and a lot of the information, the vast majority of the information coming in is just dead wrong. Ah, so there are uh -huh. people sitting in a, around a conference table uh, trying to decide what do we do, and they're being hit with all of this information, most of, most of which are lies, oh, I got you, got and they you, have got to you. make decisions. Yes. So that was one of the things I wanted, you know, I wanted to take the reader inside the White House yep. Situation Room into these classified rooms in the corners of U.S. Mm -hmm. embassies mm -hmm. to hear the conversation around the table, mm -hmm. which is both about, you know, what is going on, what do we do, and then what are all the different interests within the government trying to steer toward a particular decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be quite frustrating for people inside government. I've gotten a lot of really nice messages from colleagues at State, DOD, the White House to uh -huh. say, yes, we recognize some of those meetings you're uh -huh. describing. Uh -huh. um, but it can also be very, uh, I think, frustrating for the American public, which is, you know, how does Benghazi happen? Mm -hmm. uh, how did we allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that, you know, when people read about Benghazi or a coup in Egypt or a drone strike in Somalia, mm -hmm. that they'll think of the golden hour and that, how that happened. And also, uh, uh, just to add to that a little bit with all this uh, c incorrect information coming in, uh, you would not wonder why the United States stumbled a bit at the beginning 
of having to say what they thought was really going on and getting all this information. The other thing I thought about was more current, where President Obama says, no boots on the ground in Syria. And he says that over and over again mm -hmm. out loud. Military people of high rank are saying, well, maybe not now, but maybe right. soon. Now, there in the public eye is a disagreement between the White House and the Pentagon that you address is going on behind the scenes all the time mm -hmm. with state, White House, CIA, DOD, and all these other security agencies. That's right. I mean, that's so, you know, in that case, it's impossible for outsiders to know, is that just a public gaffe? There's many ah, people talking. Yes, yes, Maybe yes, yes. they misspoke. Uh -huh. You know, very precise words. Not everybody is always on the same page. Yeah. Uh, or is it an actual dispute within the government? Very often, even but within even if agencies. It is, even if it is, it shouldn't be out in the public, should it? Well, that's one way to fight uh, trench warfare is to use oh, the to, public oh. use the public uh, venue, absolutely. Now, when you're going in the State Department and you're walking in the door for the first day, what do they say to you? You know, <laughs> so I came, I came toward the end of the Bush administration. Uh, President Bush had been very strong on his Africa policy, mm -hmm. and he was very clear, this is what we want to achieve before the end of my administration. Mm -hmm. My boss pulled me aside and said, these are our goals in West Africa. This is what I want you to achieve while you're here, and I want you to remember something. She pulled me close. The enemy is right here in the building. And what she meant is that we are, you know, the, the, the barriers to achieving what we want to achieve are within fighting within the bureaucracy, within the State Department, within the interagency, uh, because the system is so stuck. There is so much intrigue. There is so <laughs> much uh, dog-eat-dog. Dog. So many turf battles going on behind mm -hmm. the scenes all the time. All the time. And look at... Here's the United States of America we think is, uh, you know, <laughs> we are, kind of the, the leader in the world, mm -hmm. and all of this is going on behind the scenes. Yeah. That you know, was an eye-opener <laughs> to read that. It, the people should read the book even just to learn about how the government either operates mm -hmm. or doesn't operate, huh? Yeah. I mean, some of it is just that our government is so huge and sprawling. Yeah, but, but everybody's got their goals, right? That's, that's what you say. But that's also who we are as Americans. What do, you know, in, in Egypt or in the story in Mali, the tension is we support democracy, we want democratic leaders, but we also have national security interests. Do yep. we work with a general who's just overthrown the democratic leader? What do we do when our multiple interests clash? How does that get worked out? That's the art of foreign policy making. And, but it's not, you know, it's not a beautiful thing to watch. It's actually quite an ugly thing to watch. And it often comes out in ways that maybe we're not so proud. Going back to Africa, mm. you say uh, it's uh, scorpions and snakes. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you don't know who the devil is. You don't know who the angel is. You don't know, you can't, it's not black and white. Right. And then in the United States, we want things to be boom, boom, boom. Right. It doesn't work that way there, huh? Well, you know, I've been working on Africa 25 years. Country like Nigeria, very important. The more I work on Nigeria, the more I realize how little I understand it. I think a bit of humility on the U.S. side is warranted. But I also wanted to be very clear that, you know, I tried very hard in the golden hour to paint uh, complex African characters as well. You know, we can understand the complexities on our side, there's complexities on the other side in, in Africa as well, and I wanted to give that some flavor. I wanted to be, I was frankly quite worried that I, I didn't want to fall into a cliche of having, you know, one-dimensional foreign characters. So I did try very hard to share, you know, my own experience in Africa, my love of Africa, and to give uh, some texture to the African characters. You go way back to Zimbabwe, right? As a Right. Student? My yeah. First, yeah, my first experience in Africa, I was a college student in Zimbabwe, and, you know, I stepped off the plane. I didn't know what to expect. I thought, but, but I was shocked when I stepped off. I thought it was going to be, you know, like another planet, and it really reminded me of home. It was very familiar, and I think that helped make uh, it easier to fall in love. Mm. Uh, foreign policy is messy. Uh, <laughs> Africa, it's not what you see is what you get, <laughs> by any means. Uh, this is a terrific book. 
uh, the Golden Hour. I read it, the, the whole thing, just uh, absolutely terrific. Foreign Policy, Africa, a thriller story. Uh, I'm so happy for you. It really is wonderful when something like this happens and it just takes right off. And a lasting note would be that Africa is important to the United States. Absolutely. Huh? More so than ever before. Wow. Todd, thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis. Great to visit with you. Great to be here. Thank you. For information about This Is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. This is America and the World is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. ANA, Japan's largest airline with an extensive network throughout Asia. Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology. Sharing tomorrow. The Petrolin Group, expertise with integrity in the fields of oil and gas, exploration and production, energy and infrastructure. The Republic of Kazakhstan, a rich history and a future of development and growth. The Rotondaro Family Trust, the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services.